The Tom Woods Show, episode 713. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. I am reading, or I just finished reading, a little book, a monograph, I guess, an essay by Murray Rothbard called Science, Technology, and Government. And I thought to myself, if I'm reading this and getting something out of it, why don't I share it with the audience? So that's what I'm going to do with you today. It's an interesting piece because it was written in 1959. It was discovered, it was written on commission, but we don't know other than that what the exact circumstances of its writing were, and it was never published. But it was discovered not too long ago in the Rothbard Papers, and so last year, 2015, the Mises Institute published it as a standalone work, Science, Technology, and Government, it's called. So, of course, I will link to it at tomwoods.com slash 713. And I thought I would just go through some of the main points that I gleaned from it that I thought were especially interesting. But everything I'm saying is elaborated on at great length in this piece. So if you feel like what you're hearing today isn't quite the full case that you want to hear, well, that's because it's in the Rothbard piece that I'm recommending. So first thing to do is to tell you that you can get this for free at tomwoods.com slash 713. The second thing to mention is that I would say, and if you listen to me an awful lot and you have an incredibly good memory, you'll know where I'm going here, that the best thing written on this subject of government, science, and the free market is a book by a guy named Terence Keeley. That's K-E-A-L-E-Y, and it's called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. That book just blows your mind. It's a fresh insight on every page. It's a historical insight, an analytical insight, whatever, intellectual. It's an astonishing book. It's, it's uh, just a thrilling read. And incidentally, I've tried to get Terrence Keeley on the show. He is... He'll be the first to admit it. He's notorious for being hard to track down. Well, I tracked him down. I even got him to respond and say, oh, it'd be great to be on the show. And then that's as far as it went. I couldn't get him to respond after that. Okay, how about such and such day? So that's that. Now, unfortunately, that book's out of print. But thanks to the Internet, you can find used copies here and there. So I will link to the Amazon page for the used copies of the Economic Laws of Scientific Research at TomWoods.com slash 713. You're going to be very glad you read that book. If you have any, any interest in science or if you ever get stumped or if you stumble on this question, could the free market deal with science and provide us with the research and the basic science that the whole scientific enterprise needs, this book answers it amazingly well. And I relied on it quite a bit for my own 2011 book, Rollback, so... If I have a good enough memory, I will link you to, to my book, Rollback, which basically I wanted to call that book Everything Should Be Abolished, and they didn't go for that. It's a much better title, Everything Should Be Abolished. Any argument you've had to deal with is probably in Rollback, so that'll also be linked. You can get the audiobook version of that book for free over at TomWoodsAudio.com through the Audible offer at TomWoodsAudio.com. All right, look at 1959. What's significant about that? Late 1950s. There is a big uh, concern in the U.S. that not enough resources are being devoted to scientific education. And the evidence for this is Sputnik, is the, the launching of, well, it turns out to be numerous Soviet satellites into orbit. And this goes to show that the United States is lagging behind. So Rothbard apparently took that opportunity to talk about what the free market can accomplish even when it comes to something like scientific research. And he begins with, of course, the classic Austrian point that research, resources that you might put toward scientific research are resources that could be used in other areas, whether it's manpower or physical resources. These resources compete with all the other goals and needs that these resources might otherwise satisfy. So we have to bear in mind that simply saying we want more science might sound fine, but on the other hand, at the expense of what? Think of it this way, obviously devoting all society's resources to scientific research and nothing else. So no growing food, 
no providing clothing for anybody. This would obviously be too many resources devoted to science. Not doing anything at all would be too few. How do we know what, how to strike the right balance? And there's really no non-arbitrary way to do that other than the voluntary interactions of people on the free market. And Rothbard says that if we're going to be involved in this, you know, we're in this competition with the Soviets, and it's, it's, it's an implicit test before the world of two possible world systems. There are other world systems, of course, Rothbard's own, but in other words, a planned economy and a mostly non-planned economy. Then wouldn't it be better if our scientific research were done on a free basis as opposed to on a coercive basis, funded coercively and planned out by the authorities? He says, isn't freedom rather than coercion not only the best way to spur efficiency and scientific advance, but also the way to show the peoples of the world, including the peoples of the Soviet bloc, that the American way of freedom can beat the Soviet way of coercion at any time and on any ground. If on the contrary we try to race with the Soviets by employing essentially Soviet methods, which ideology will come to look better to the peoples of the world? The more we stress free and voluntary methods in our competition with the Soviets, the more do we show that we believe our own speeches on the merits and glories of freedom. The more we rely on coercive or statist methods, the more do we undercut our own ideology, appear as hypocrites to the nations of the world, and thus contribute to the ultimate victory of the, of the Soviet ideology. Now, of course, after Sputnik, everybody was saying we have a shortage of scientists, and we need government involvement to uh, improve the situation. Well, Rothbard says certainly subsidizing science students is only going to make the situation worse because all that's going to do is push salaries down and therefore uh, drive people even farther away from the sciences. So that would just be counterproductive. We shouldn't want to do that. But moreover, is it really true that there's a shortage of scientists? And he goes into the economic sense of what a shortage would really mean but he also goes into the colloquial, empirical sense of what a shortage would mean. And he cites an article, a study done for the National Bureau of Economic Research in 1957 by David Blank and George Stiegler. And they found that in the previous 80 years, the number of chemists and engineers in the U.S. had expanded by more than 17 times as much as the total labor force. And that since 1939, the salaries of engineers relative to the earnings of doctors, dentists, and lawyers had declined relative to manufacturing wage earners. So even the salaries of clergymen, uh, pharmacists, and school teachers rose uh, relative to engineers. So he's saying that, that uh, this does not look like a shortage to him. Uh, then Rothbard cites a book uh, written by three authors uh, in the late 1950s, The Sources of Invention. The book looks at 61 of the most important inventions of the 20th century and finds that more than half of those were the work of individual inventors working at their own direction and with very limited resources. And this is meant to be a reply to people who say, oh, the world is too sophisticated today for the individual inventor to amount to anything. But to the contrary, that is not at all unusual. And Rothbard cites as evidence of this inventions like air conditioning, automatic transmission, the ballpoint pen, the electron microscope, the helicopter, insulin, the jet engine, the Polaroid camera, radio, titanium, the zipper, and many uh, more examples. And then Rothbard says that of the inventions studied that were achieved in industrial research laboratories, some arose in small firms, and others were more or less accidental byproducts of other work rather than, pre that, rather than pre planned and pre directed. And he gives many examples of that. And then in still other cases, inventions in the research labs of large companies were made by small research teams that were often centered around one man. And he gives the example of nylon at the DuPont laboratories. Now, why has the independent inventor been so successful? Here's Rothbard's speculation. He says that it, it stems from the very nature of invention. The essential feature of innovation is that the path to it is not known beforehand. So the less an inventor is pre-committed in his speculation by training or tradition, the better his chance of the better the chance of his escaping from the grooves of accepted thought. 
There are many recorded in instances, he goes on, of the inventor winning out despite the scoffing of the recognized experts in the field, perhaps even emboldened because he didn't know enough to be discouraged. One authority maintains that Farnsworth benefited from his lack of contact with the outside scientific world. Once a professor gave him four good reasons why his idea, later successful, could not possibly work. Before the discovery of the transistor, many scientists claimed that nothing more could be learned in that field. Eminent mathematicians once claimed to prove logically that short wave radio was impossible. Government controlled research, Rothbard goes on, goes on, would undoubtedly rely on existing authorities and thus would snuff out the searching of the truly original minds. Many of the great inventors of recent times could not have gotten a research job in the field for lack of expertise. The inventors of Kodachrome were musicians. Eastman, the great inventor in photography, was a bookkeeper at the time. The inventor of the ballpoint pen was an artist and journalist. The automatic dialing system was invented by an undertaker. A veterinarian invented the pneumatic tire. Moreover, there are many inventors who are part-time or one-shot inventors who are clearly more useful on their own than as part of a research team. And then Rothbard goes on to talk about the problems with directing research from above, and that this doesn't always yield such good results. And he quotes O.E. Buckley, who at the time was president of the, or who when he was president of the Bell Telephone Laboratory, said this, one sure way to defeat the scientific spirit is to attempt to direct inquiry from above. All successful industrial research directors know this and have learned by experience that one thing a director of research must never do is to direct research. Uh, Rothbard cites uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, discoverer of penicillin, who said, certain industrial places put up a certain amount of money for research and hire a team. They then direct them on the particular problems they're going to work out. This is a very good way of employing a certain number of people, paying salaries, and not getting very much in return. Well, what about the claim that government monopoly direction of research will eliminate wasteful overlapping of effort? Can't have several different scientists doing the same thing at the same time. We shouldn't have that wasteful overlapping. We'll just have the government run the science. But then Rothbard points out the, the importance for scientists in having two or more mutually independent scientists or laboratories confirming each other's conclusions. Because that's how you provisionally confirm uh, a, uh, a scientific experiment. Now, Rothbard also spends a lot of time, not surprisingly, on the problems with Soviet science. I think there's less need to review that today. I think everybody would acknowledge the problems with the whole Soviet system. But at that time, that was the real propaganda force pushing forward more government involvement in and subsidy to science. So I, I, I will allow you to read that on your own. But he, I will point out one thing, the whole Sputnik thing about the Soviets uh, putting... Um, satellites into orbit. And Rothbard says this, in the first place, if one starts with a given end and the knowledge of how to get there has already been attained, one can arrive at the end in proportion to the resources one is willing to throw into the undertaking. All this then becomes a purely engineering and economic problem rather than a scientific research problem where ends or means are not yet known. If for some military or propagandist purpose it was desirable to make a very deep hole toward the center of the earth, the deepest holes would probably be made by whichever nation decided to devote the largest amount of money to the project. The same principle applies to the Sputniks. So it's not really a scientific problem. It's a matter of who can commandeer more of soci society's resources into a particular project. Well. That's not the hard part, obviously. Uh, co commandeering resources can be done by, uh, by any coercive uh, structure, so that shouldn't really surprise us that much. But moreover, the American satellites had far superior instrumentation and therefore were much more important scientifically. Rothbard spends some time also talking about why military research should be done in private rather than government labs if the... And of course, you know, Rothbard is much more radical than that proposition makes it sound. But his point is, if if, if we're going on the government's own grounds and, and they you know, they want to get the best results they can, then they should they should use the private, which in, indeed increasingly they did. 
And uh, Rothbard also has a lot of discussion of atomic energy, and I'll also leave that uh, to your reading if you're interested in that subject. But again, I'll give you just a taste of, of one of the points he makes. He says that in the nuclear age, of course, atomic energy has been held up as the chief model, right, the chief argument of people who say that government control and government direction of science is necessary under modern conditions. They say, look, at the very least in the atomic field, we need that, and look at the success we've had with government. Uh, because, they, of course, they look at the great team that was put together to get the atomic bomb, uh, uh, to make that into a reality. But it turns out that the, the fundamental atomic discoveries had been made by academic scientists working with simple equipment. And, in fact, one of those scientists put it this way, we couldn't afford elaborate equipment, so we had to think. And then we have the fact that up to the end of 1940, virtually all the early work on atomic energy was financed by private foundations and universities. And as Rothbard puts it, the development of the bomb was, for peacetime purposes, an extremely wasteful uh, process. The friction on the project between scientists and administrators, the great difficulties of administration has been pointed out often. And moreover, it's been suggested that government control of research slowed down rather than speeded up peacetime atomic development especially with his, its excessive secrecy and restrictions. Rothbard also deals with the, the claim, various claims about basic research. We need more subsidies to basic research. But he then cited the Hoover Task Force, which was a government uh, task force, that found that g government was basically not even competent to perform even military research and development, much less civilian. And Rothbard concludes by saying... There are various things government can do that would spur scientific research, but they all involve government getting out of various things, uh, lowering all kinds of taxes, uh, and possibly even giving uh, tax credits to various activities. And, and, that was, and that basically, in a nutshell, is the Rothbardian critique. Now, we can supplement this with a lot of the conclusions reached by Keeley. I mean, really, Rothbard is blazing a trail for future free market people to look further into how the free market can deal uh, with, with the sciences. And what Keeley found is, first of all, that even when it comes to basic science, you know, this is, in other words, scientists just without a, 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 a you know, a, a dictated research agenda, but who are, uh, you know, who, in other words, who, they're not trying to develop some particular product let's say, something very specific. They're doing research that's on a more basic and fundamental and foundational level. The free market has been better on that, has done more basic research than, uh, than government has funded. And Keeley showed that as a percentage of GDP, when science was more in the province of the private sector, more was spent on science. Surprising result. And this result comes up over and over and over again. That, uh, in fact, there's plenty in Japan, for example, um, research and development is almost entirely private and it's being done either in universities or in industrial laboratories and there are reasons again uh, Keeley explains how it is that government that uh, without government you're able to get all these different things even though it seems like basic research at the very least doesn't yield you immediate profits so why would you invest money in it or it's if it does yield you anything what it yields you can just be snapped up by competitors so you know why would it ever come to being so I go into this in a little bit more detail in rollback and talk about exactly how it does come about but for our purposes today the point is it does come about you do actually get plenty of basic science under the free market just not in government laboratories so if people are objecting to you that this can't happen well who are you gonna believe these critics are your own eyes Keeley also points out that basic science actually contributes much less to human flourishing, well-being, and to the progress of the sciences than you would think. You would think, oh, basic science is foundational, but our scientific progress largely stems from taking what's already known and extending it and building on it. Or people who aren't just in lab coats in a laboratory somewhere, but practical people out there in the world who, who need who need some improvement, and they somehow figure it out, even in, even in defiance of what the experts tell them. So the steam engine is an example of that. And of course, we've barely even gotten into the politicization of science, that what overwhelmingly happens is that 
when the government does subsidize it, it, it finds out what's the consensus view, and it subsidizes the consensus view. Well, the consensus view is correct a lot of the time, but not always. And now people who don't hold to the consensus view have trouble getting published. They can't get funding for their research. They're viewed as weirdos and outcasts. They can't get a hearing. And so it pushes science into particular uh, politically popular directions and thwarts the normal discovery process that we want to see in science. Well, there's a lot more that can be said about this, but again, I, I want to refer you to the, the Rothbard work and to that g tremendous Keeley book, both linked at tomwoods.com slash 713. I owe several of you who have new websites uh, a, a show mention, and I will be getting to those over the next few episodes, so thanks for continuing to uh, do that. Let's see, I am hoping to have, if I can make the scheduling work, a nice roundtable discussion for you with some super fun and interesting people tomorrow on a fantastic topic. I'm being deliberately vague because if I can't come through with it, you're going to be crushed and devastated to have to wait till Monday for that. So let's just say you're going to like my roundtable discussion tomorrow. I'm just going to leave it at that, and thank you very much, as always, for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.